Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Before we begin, just wanted to let people know that inshallah today, the topic that we talk about um, does concern um, a, a fairly, it's a very sensitive topic to all of us, it should be, um, but can be very heavy um, as we discuss uh, the topic of when a child dies. But uh, inshallah, we'll be talking more specifically to some of the events that have been going on. And uh, if this is something that's heavy or weighty, um, that you need to take some space from, please feel free to do so and exercise as much of your prerogative to do so um, in that matter. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inahu wa nasta'ufiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyaati amalina man yadi illahu falamudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu falahadiya lah wa ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ahduhu la sharika lahu wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all praise is due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our own bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray and whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, the one who has no partner. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is Allah's servant and messenger. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون O ye who believe be mindful be mindful of Allah be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in the state of full submission to Allah سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Again, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, everyone, again, Juma Mubarak. Um, we come to this Juma with heavy hearts, um, regardless of where we might be coming from. This past week, we all saw and heard of the horrific tragedy in the news out of Uvalde, Texas, uh, and the deadly shooting that took place at the Rob Elementary School, uh, which claimed the lives of 21 persons, uh, two teachers, and 19 children that were aged anywhere from nine to 11, majority of whom were 10 years old. Uh, just weeks after we saw uh, and heard of the tragedy of the top supermarket shooting uh, in Buffalo, which left 10 of our black brothers and sisters uh, killed. And so, you know, words can't really suffice at this time. This is, these are two uh, shootings and of, of hundreds more that, that happened this year. And, and, you know, it's just, it seems like one after the other and the words can't seem to suffice for the many emotions of anger, rage, sorrow, grief, and hopelessness we might be feeling at this time, you know, as deadly as this school shooting was, uh, this one at Rob Elementary, um, the, uh, the deadliest since the 2012 Sandy Hook uh, Elementary School shooting, it's the 27th school shooting this year. And it's the 200th and, and, and over 200th uh, mass shooting um, this year as well. And so more than there have been calendar days, there have been mass shootings in this country. And uh, again, as sad and as tragic as it is, can we really all say that we're surprised that something like this would and did happen again in a country where it's quite frankly easier to go out buy a semi-automatic uh, weapon of war like an AR-15 uh, than it is to get a driver's license or than it is to uh, maintain a vehicle or register a vehicle or own a vehicle. Um, are we really surprised when this country has had over 2,000 school shootings since, like, if that have, that have left over 600 people dead since 1970? You know, are we surprised when we live in a country where more students have died this year from gunshot wounds at school than police officers have in the line of duty. Again, are we surprised that uh, we live in a country where more students have died from gunshot wounds in school than police officers on the line of duty? You know, as Muslims, as Americans, as human beings who are held hostage by the agenda of politicians and political lobbies and so on, we sometimes find ourselves and oftentimes find ourselves trapped. Uh, we feel in a sense, not just gridlocked in, in, in this political space, but we oftentimes just find ourselves boxed in uh, within our own frameworks, asking ourselves, what can we do? 
what we ask ourselves, you know, what, what, what can our faith do at this time? What value does our faith have? What, what can Islam uh, and our faith teach us in moments like these? I named this khutbah uh, and titled it, you know, when a child dies, but I want to be clear that this is not going to be some kind of fiqh based talk where, or a sermon that deals specifically with the death of children, um, but it rather inquires and it inquires and it interrogates for each of us as Muslims to know not just our uh, duties and obligations to children in this world, but our obligation to them in their death, uh, especially in light of the example of the Prophet ﷺ, the teaching of Islam and in the matters of injustice, as was the case at Rob Elementary School this past week. Um, though we might be physically, socially, politically limited in our ability to make a difference in this in this society or a tangible change uh, in this country to stop the next mass shooting or anything of the sort, does our faith not offer us anything at this time that can be a source of strength for us as well as the communities that we live in and that we serve? So what's actually interesting and reassuring in some way is that though our faith can, uh, is, is though our faith can and does provide us guidance on what to do when a child dies uh, and when injustices occur in our world. Um, it, it does so, especially when we are left feeling hopeless, when we are in, in kind of these dire depths. And so, uh, you know, before we even get into the death of a child, especially one that is done so unjustly and so grossly, uh, we must understand what Islam imbues upon the child and provides as a sacred status and certain inalienable rights that are given which make the unjust death or killing of a child not just an injustice, but it's an infringement upon their rights and the rights of what is sacred. So according to a joint text that was put out, a book that was put out by Al-Azhar University and UNICEF, it was titled Children in Islam, Their Care, Their Upbringing and Protection. Uh, Islam guarantees children certain basic inalienable rights um, that can be summarized as and, and can be encapsulated from the sources of the Quran and the Hadith uh, as, as basically, in a sense, the first, um, the child having a right to health, uh, health care or nutrition and having a the right to a healthy start in life, the right to just be well and the right to be given, uh, you know, avenues of wellness and to be cared for. The a child has a right to be protected that a child has a right to be protected and safe from any type of harm, to lead a dignified and secure life within the safety of the place that they're born and the society they're born. The child has a right to an education and an acquisition of skills and to be able to learn and grow and develop. The child has a right to a family, a kindred, name, property, and inheritance. And so when we don't up, uphold these rights. When these rights are not upheld in the slightest, we don't just transgress against the child, but we do so as well against Allah. And when, uh, when we think about this, that it's from Allah whom these children came to us, came to this world as an amana, as a trust, that a violation of their rights is a violation of the trust that is there with Allah. And so when we see in this circumstance here, when you have a country where mass shootings are becoming the norm, the child is, uh, is the, each of these rights is violated grossly. The child's health is violated, whether they are wounded or whether they are uh, deceased uh, and they, they, they are killed uh, in cold blood. The child's right to safety is violated because they're not safe anymore. Um, and even at this moment, we want to ask ourselves, how, how are we relating to these rights? Are we violating these rights as we speak, even during, even when we're not in moments of tragedy? We, the child has a right to an education, a right to be able to grow, to learn, to become uh, whoever they uh, want to be and whoever they need to be for their society. And the child has a right to a family, has a right to be with their family, has a right to be loved by their family and uh, be uh, a member of that family. So thinking about the, the society we live in today, going tangentially uh, in, in this, but, but to also uh, talk about how these things are all interconnected, that we may talk, be talking about mass shootings and how uh, children have been gunned down in broad daylight in the place we oftentimes think is the safest place for them. But we live in a society where the, the access to health 
is something that has been stripped from children. We see there's baby shortage, baby formula shortage um, that that is there. We we I was at a vigil just now um, and uh, earlier this week, and and literally uh, the the emphasis came up that we're spending billions on war while we are uh, while we have no. Um, shortage, or we have we have a shortage of baby formula. That there's more guns in this country than there is baby for baby formula. So, does the child have a right to health in the society we are now, seeing that we're violating that? Does the child have uh, is the child safe, secure, protected when we're teaching our children along with their curriculum how to hide from shooters or how to uh, be trained in active shooting in their own school places? Is the child truly secure? Does the child have, are we upholding the child's right to an education when we are uh, allowing for such decimation and such slaughter to occur within those educated spaces? And are we allowing the child to be loved by their family and to spend time with their family and be nurtured by their family when we're allowing for things to happen that separate them from their family permanently? So in addition to these inalienable rights, again, the, the part of which when they're violated, they're not just a violation against that child and their individual right, but they're a violation against a law and the God-given right that these are to each of the children. So it's a, it's a, it's an affront to the divine. It's a, it's a, uh, it's it's something that's akin to haram. It's something that's forbidden to violate such rights, and it's something that is done and being done on an active basis. And so, in addition to these inalienable rights, we see how they were added upon even furthermore and further sacralized and made sacred by the person of the Prophet Sallam and his demeanor towards children. That not only did the Prophet Sallam imbue and emphasize these rights, but he went a step further to change the mentality of the society and specifically of the people that that were that dwelled within it as it pertained to children. The Prophet was known to be a very kind person to children, that he would not say as much as oof to a child or would never even strike a child or say anything to belittle the child. Uh, the Prophet uh, a, a, a very famous incident occurred in which he would he used to carry his granddaughter, Umama, uh, and when he would prostrate in prayer, he would put her on the ground, and upon rising from the prostration, he would carry her again. Um, and there's another narration with the Prophet's love for children shared uh, by Abu Huraira that said that uh, the Prophet uh, would kiss his grandson, Hussein, uh, the son of Ali, um, and, you know, with, with his other um, uh, grandson, Hassan, um, you know, the, the, he would also kiss him as well, and in, in the presence of a another Sahaba, uh, other Sahabi, and the Sahabi responded that I have ten children, and I've never kissed any of them, kind of how how you are kissing your grandchildren. And the Prophet some looked at, back at him and says, "He who shows no mercy will not be shown any mercy, or he who shows no mercy will be shown no mercy." So just thinking about the psychology that in that moment, the Prophet was being kind to a child, show them love. And if we don't show a child love, if we don't show them affection, how do we expect to be shown affection? How do we expect to be shown mercy? And extending this into the society we live in now, that's not just limited to hugs and kisses. Think about when we are not giving that child being merciful with that child, giving them their right to an education, their right to safety, their right to health, their right to a family. If we're not upholding these, how do we expect Allah to do the same for us? And how the Prophet would uh, would be playful with children, would be uh, would be involved in their lives, would be someone who uh, keeps them smiling and emphasizes their laughter and their playing rather than to uh, harp on them or to violate their rights. That's so Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was marked as someone who not only was kind to children, but sought to incorporate that and inculcate that within the community, that this uh, upholding of their uh, love of their rights is not just an act of being a good person, but it's a show of the divine mercy. It's a show of mercy so that we may be shown mercy. The Prophet was also showing us how to react when a child passes away. As we know, the Prophet had a very uh, famous incident when his, uh, his final surviving son who had passed away at, in infancy, Ibrahim, um, had passed away. Uh, the Prophet was deeply attached to Ibrahim. He would, when Ibrahim was alive, he would take him around and show him to people and be very happy, even though he was in his older age. 
And when Ibrahim passed away, um, you know, prematurely when he passed away, uh, the Prophet's reaction to Ibrahim passed away was very emotive. It was very powerful to where he's shedding tears and he says, Oh, Ibrahim, you know, the uh, the eyes weep, the heart bleeds um, from and is sad, uh, but our mouth and our tongue will not say anything except that which ple it pleases our Lord. Um, and, and says that, oh, Ibrahim, we're saddened by your loss. We're saddened by your, your going and your leaving and your departing. And the Sahaba around him say like, Ya Rasulullah, what, what is this? Like, you know, they see him crying, they see his tears and they say, what is this? And Prophet ﷺ responds, this is a mercy. In the death of a child, in the unfair circumstance of which a child is taken um, in, in such a, uh, a young age, in an infant age, the Prophet ﷺ lifted up how one should conduct themselves, that at the least one should have a heart and feel sad. One should be emotive in that space, but also one should express their hurt. One should acknowledge that their uh, their eyes are weeping, their eyes are, are, are crying, they're wet, their chest is hurting because of the, the pain of the loss, but their mouth will not utter that except which pleases their Lord. The Prophet taught us that even in the moments when a child dies, that there's a way we can conduct ourselves, but at the foremost of it is to show uh, that, be, to at least be connected to where our hearts are not hardened, that we feel the pain when a child dies. We feel that pain just as much as any other uh, aspect of loss in our life, even more so we feel it when a child dies. And the process I'm also lifted up when uh, when listening when listening to the story of a Sahaba who had buried his uh, his his child his daughter um, he recounted to the Prophet some how um, you know he was burying his daughter and the daughter was you know wiping the dust off of uh, his feet or wiping the dust off of his hands that when he was lowering his daughter his daughter was wiping it off but would hold his hand um, as he's trying to bury her it's a very powerful image of a society that had a clear marked injustice towards its children was committing infanticide towards uh, certain children, especially baby girls. Um, and, and this powerful image of this child, uh, you know, just, just holding her father, being there for her father while her father is uh, committing this atrocity and bearing her. And at the end of the story where the Prophet, when, when the Sahaba finishes, the Sahabi finishes, um, the Prophet is drenched, his beard is wet, and he's weeping, and uh, he, he lifts up that had Allah not forgiven the sins of people after they had come into Islam, the Prophet would have never forgiven this person for what they had done. So the Prophet shows us that impact and that uh, the, the seriousness with which we should pay attention to not just injustices, but to be present to those injustices, to feel for them, not just to be so hardened that we just uh, we just become numb to the injustices and just you know absorb them as is and not think twice about them, but to feel them, to feel the loss, to feel connected to uh, those who are lost, especially in ch as children, um, and to see uh, how uh, the, their loss is not something that we, we, we simply just gloss over, but it's, it's a cause for us to pause, to reflect, and to really uh, be connected to. As the Prophet ﷺ, he never knew this person's daughter. He never knew this child. Yet the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was so you know, incensed by this, but still the Prophet ﷺ was, was honest. The Prophet ﷺ shared his sentiment with this person, um, yet the Prophet ﷺ also expressed himself uh, visually. And this is a society that uh, espoused very strong uh, masculine values and, and uh, attributed a very uh, strong chivalrous ethic to and conduct to men. And so to see the process of to be bawling and to, you know, just be emoting as he is, uh, is, is, is something that, that draws for us as well in this time and age when we see so many different injustices to be at peace with being able to express ourselves. It's not a mark of shame to shed those tears. It's not a mark of shame to feel sad. Um, and it's not a mark of shame to uh, be feeling at, at a bit of a loss. These are these are absolutely normal. And the process um, showed us that, especially in the death of a child, this is what we lift up. But at the end of the day, we hold our tongue that uh, we don't say that which 
accept that which pleases our Lord, but uh, in a word spoken against injustice, a word spoken against oppressor. Are, these are blessed words, and these are things which we should use our tongue for, but uh, to uh, use it respectfully as well, especially when relating to the divine. And additionally, the Prophet taught us that in times of justice, in times uh, of collective societal injustice, it is pertinent to not just stand up to that injustice, but to do so in the form of coalition building and working with other people. There's a famous account of the Hilful Fudul, um, this pact uh, of chivalry, this pact of uh, goodness and, and you know just collectiveness that was brought together um, during the the pre-Islamic period, during the uh, during the life of the Prophet but when he was just a young uh, a young man, and uh, when this uh, pact came up because of the uh, rights of a merchant being infringed upon and uh, the injustices committed upon this merchant, um, all the tribes had come together and made a pact uh, of solitude, had made a pact together. Um, that they would uphold the rights of the foreigner, they would uphold the rights of someone like this, um, and they uh, all came together to uphold these rights. And the Prophet lifts up uh, in in Islam later on that there was a pact that was taken, and there was he detailed you know how it came to be, and said that it was such a beautiful pact and a coming together of people for the purpose of justice that if it was to be presented to him in Islam after uh, the revelation and everything, he would still sign it without any issue. He would still sign on to it. And what this pact teaches us is that whenever we're in a place, whenever um, we uh, are in a place that experiences injustice. Um, or the wrong uh, wronging of any individual or person or the transgression of someone's basic rights that we don't only stand up individually, uh, but we work with our communities, Muslim, non-Muslim, our neighbors, other entities, institutions to collectively met out the injustice. Uh, Ali ibn Abdi Talib taught us that if a person is not your uh, sibling uh, in faith, that they're your equal in humanity. Um, so to, to emphasize that the need to not just be able to uh, stand up for justice in our own spaces, but to be called to do so and to be recommended to do so by the Prophet in matters uh, that, uh, that involve other parts of the society as well. And when, we, uh, when we're talking about especially the injustice with respect to children, um, what, what, what this teaches us um, when we are being uh, mindful of children, when we are lifting up this justice specifically for children, it teaches us that we, uh, we need to be humane to children. The Prophet and his example, his weeping, his tears, his emotion uh, showed us that we need to be humane to children. We need to be mindful and to have a heart, especially in moments of pain and tragedy to not be unfazed or apathetic when tragedies like the Robb Elementary shooting or Sandy Hook uh, shooting come to mind, but to mourn, to show that emotion, uh, but also to show up. And when we show up, we show up with other people who are also uh, part of this community who also are affected. And we don't just work in our silos, we work together. Uh, additionally, the Quran teaches us as well the gravity of not only murder, but especially that of a child. Uh, we see the process, uh, in, in the Quran, uh, the, the example lifted up of the baby girl asking when she's buried, uh, who had been buried, uh, the baby girl asking for what crime was she buried? For what crime was she killed that you know she had been buried early um, and been a product or had been subjected to infanticide? For what crime was she killed? Um, and for what crime was she buried? It's showing us that these kids have the last word, they truly do. And even those kids who were shot, those kids who were killed, whether it's at uh, Newtown, Connecticut, or if it's in Uvalde, uh, Texas, that these kids will have the last say that on the on that day, whether it's the baby girl asking for what crime was she buried, uh, or the child in Uvalde or in Newtown asking for what crime were they shot and killed, um, it, it's harrowing for us to think about theologically that these kids will have the last word uh, with respect to not just their oppressors, but also to ask us that when we are complicit in a society that allows for such shootings to happen, for our schools to turn into war zones and places that uh, children are more at risk to be shot than police officers, that we are complicit in that. And what will we say to those children who ask us for what crime were they shot? For what crime were they killed? For what crime were they buried? We want to ask ourselves, 
what role did we play and are we ready to face those children? We can look at their pictures and we can weep and we can be sad, but are we ready to answer them when they ask us for what crime were they killed? And of course, in the Quran, it lifts up how a single soul being killed is as if all of humanity was killed, that whosoever kills a single person or a soul, it's as if they kill all of humanity. And it's so true that when one child is even killed, when one person is even killed, we don't just feel that all of humanity is lost, we feel that we've lost a part of our own humanity, seeing our collective responsibility in it, that we are not just people on the side who are not, whose hands are not clean as well or guilty, but we, we, we see that our hands are also complicit when murders like this happen, when political issues like this spill over uh, and become a fabric of the society that you cannot escape it, that we too lose part of our humanity as each of these happen and we haven't been able to stop it or don't stop it at all. And even in the, the Christian tradition, the gospel, you have uh, Isa alayhi salam lift up that, uh, you know, for children, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, that they, to them it belongs. And to just think about that intersection with our theology in, in Islam, that uh, the, the buried girl, the child that was killed unjustly, will have that word to be said. It's as if they're, they're at the gate and they're allowing people in and they're, they're kind of holding them to account and they're part of that admissions team that's there. But just think about it uh, and think about the impact that it has on us at this moment. Are we, when we lose our humanity with each and every child that dies, how do we work to restore that? So Islam does not just teach us to restore and acknowledge the humanity of others, but first and foremost, also do so for ourselves, to acknowledge that we are not uh, perfect, that we mess up, we make mistakes, but that we have a chance to try and redeem ourselves and to restore the humanity that was stripped away, not just from the people who were killed unjustly, but each of us whose humanity also goes without us protesting uh, or, or trying to do something right when, when the wrong is what's become the normative. Uh, Islam teaches us that not just to stand up for justice, not just to be witnesses for justice, but to be so collectively, holistically, as fabrics of our community and, and part of this tapestry of all different uh, people of different faiths and walks of life. And so uh, as we think about this, we want to evaluate how much has Islam played a factor for us in, in such difficult times? And uh, if it hasn't, ask us why not? Why hasn't Islam, knowing that who the Prophet was, knowing what our book is, knowing what the teachings of Islam are, why do we not feel that need, that cause, that permission to be able to use our faith for the tool of healing that it is, not just for ourselves, but the society around us. So we ask Allah to grant us mercy, comfort, and we ask Allah to grant that that mercy, that comfort, and that ease specifically to the victims of the shooting uh, that happened in Uwalde, to specifically to the shoot the victims of the shooting in Buffalo and to all other places that have been impacted by senseless violence, that their families and all others who were uh, these victims and their loved ones be comforted. And we ask Allah to allow us to at the least, at the least, not become numb to this loss and tragedy to where we just accept it like different weather patterns and to in, to and that within each of these people that become the victims that are on uh, their images shown across the world and in the news and everything, that we start to see ourselves that we start to see our families, that we start to see the children, we start to see our parents, we start to see our spouses. And so we start to see their loss, their absence in this world as our loss as well. Inshallah, we'll conclude with a listing of these, pe these uh, people's names, inshallah, at the uh, second part of this. I say these words of mine, I ask Allah for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. My thanks and gratitude belong to Allah, the Lord of all of humanity, and I ask Allah to bless and bestow peace upon the Prophet Sallallahu So as we close, I want us to hear, and I want us to remember the names of those who had uh, been killed unjustly in Uwalde, um, and remember the obligation that we owe to them and to all victims, not just of gun violence, um, but uh, the complicity that we have in this injustice and this injustice that has gone on and that in this injustice that predictably will continue. But we want to recognize where's our humanity in this. The first and to begin, Eva Mireles, Irma Garcia.
Uzia Garcia, Xavier Lopez, Amadi Joe Garza, Jose Flores Jr., Alitia Ramirez, Annabel Guadalupe Rodriguez, Eliana Cruz Torres, Eli, Eliana uh, Eli Garcia, Rogelio Torres, Jacqueline, Saza, Za, Jacqueline Casares, Jayla, Jayla Nicole Silvero, Jace Carmelo Luevanos, Alexandria Lexi Ania Rubio, Tess Mata, McKenna Lee Elrod, Nevai Bravo, Leila Salazar. So wherever you may be after this kupa, thinking about these names, thinking about the faces, thinking about the people, not just who have been mentioned, but the hundreds, the thousands that have not been mentioned, that are taken year after year, time after time. Take this moment to be with your loved ones. Call your parents, hold your children, tell your spouses that you love them. Remember how delicate and fleeting life is that we wanna treat each moment, though we may not like it, but that we face the reality that we treat each moment with those whom we love as if it is our last. And we ask Allah that as we navigate these difficult times, as we go through these difficult times, that Allah makes us uh, and allows us to improve upon all of that which we do to allow us to become the best Muslims that we can in this time, to recognize that when a child dies, when anyone dies, in whether they're Muslim, not Muslim, however they die, but especially if they die because of an injustice and because of an injustice that we may be complicit in or may be a part of in some way, shape or form, or maybe even just in proximity of that we owe that child a responsibility when they die. We owe that person, that victim a responsibility when they die, that we at least can weep for them. We at least can feel for them that when this person dies, when this child dies, when whoever dies uh, because of this injustice, that first and foremost, we feel it. Secondly, we, we express it. We, we express that hurt. But thirdly, apart from feeling that hurt, apart from expressing that hurt, praying for them and holding at least our, our hearts, breaking the hardness that, that sometimes characterizes them to soften our hearts to them, we try to collectively organize to make sure that this does not happen again. And we follow the prophetic example of not just being there when a child dies, to weep for the child, to uh, lift up as an example to others, the power that mercy has, the power that emotion has to play, but we stay respectful of our Lord. And in staying respectful to our Lord, we find that it doesn't just mean we sit down and do nothing, that we stand up and we keep pushing, especially when we are facing matters of injustice, to the extent that we can to met out that injustice. And so we ask Allah that Allah enables us to not just be the best Muslims that we can, but to be the best humans that we can, to be the best citizens that we can, that our faith becomes something more than just we one thing that we identify with or that we name as, and that we can be people who not only transform society, but we uh, are becoming transformed as agents of change and benefit for all people. We ask Allah for forgiveness for any of our shortcomings, especially as it pertains to matters of injustice in this past year and throughout our life. We ask Allah to engender a love for one another in our hearts. We ask Allah for peace and justice to prevail for all those who've been wronged, victimized, and murdered by those who claim to uphold justice. We ask Allah to comfort the oppressed of the world and to enable uh, us to be those comforters for them. We ask Allah to comfort us and com and as Allah had comforted those who were beloved to Allah. And we ask Allah to alleviate all of the suffering for those who had suffered and who are suffering from the endemic of this gun violence in this country and to help us be facilitators of this alleviation. That we ask Allah to be with all those who are marginalized and targeted by persons and institutions in power, that they might be protected and their oppressors dismantled and defeated. And lastly, we ask Allah to allow our experiences, our setbacks and our wounds experienced during this time and all others who would experience such woundedness and pain to be experienced as a time of healing for themselves, for us, and for the world around us. 
and that we may leave this Juma better than we had entered it. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahima wa ala Ali Ibrahima inna ka amidun majeed. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahima wa ala Ali Ibrahima inna ka amidun majeed. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samil alim. Our Lord, accept this from us. Indeed, you are the all-hearing, the all-knowing. Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Our Lord, accept this prayer from us. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And again, uh, Juma Mubarak to you all. Uh, just recognize that as we go out here, please do take this moment, take the moments after Juma to try your best to connect with those who you love most and, and just treat each moment as sacred um, because there are people now and this week and going forward who don't have that opportunity with their loved ones. So we want to show our gratitude to Allah by at least doing that and acting upon the blessings that we've been given, if even if it is just the limited time we have with our children, our loved ones, our parents, our spouses, and so on and so forth. So take care of yourselves. Have a blessed weekend. We have a safe weekend. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.